Hello, friends. I'm Annie Murchie, Curator of Agriculture at El Rancho de las Golondrinas, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Golondrinas Live Sessions. As we prepare for this weekend's 52nd Annual Santa Fe Harvest Festival and our annual harvest of green chilies, squash, corn, beans, and sorghum, we want to share the story and significance of seeds with Jared Haygood from Lineage Seeds. Lineage Seeds is a small organic seed company based in Powake, New Mexico, offering open pollinated, mostly heirloom seeds for you to grow at home. Their seeds are thoughtfully packaged in handmade clay pots, honoring a tradition that has been cherished for thousands of years. Each pot also contains a scroll detailing the variety, days to maturity, the location where it was grown, and the lineage of the people who cultivated the seed before you. Though small and easily overlooked, the importance of seeds for your daily survival cannot be overstated. Thanks to the commitment of companies like Lineage Seeds, our future is guaranteed to thrive. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jared Ryan Haygood and I'm an organic seed farmer. Um, I'm here in Puaque, New Mexico and I've been farming uh, 18 years now. And my story is uh, one of somebody following what matters in life, what's valuable to learn, um, and finding myself uh, being a steward of, of seeds and um, in service of something much bigger than myself. It's been, it's been a big journey and it's one that we all should connect to as well. Um, I actually grew up a city kid in, in Memphis of all places, Memphis, Tennessee. I never saw a garden or nothing growing. I left at 18, started asking those questions. Who are we? Why are we here? Where do we come from? Um, went and lived in Spain, lived in France, lived in Morocco, Turkey, had a lot of odd jobs, uh, just all the while asking, you know, what's worth, what's worth learning, what's worth knowing and, and studying in my twenties that would be valuable to, uh, everyone in the world, no matter what race, religion, uh, no matter what happened in the world economically, I wanted to really find a trade that, um, that would be value of all of us no matter what. And I got very fortunate to uh, stumble into farming at 21 um, and became a, uh, a market farmer to start just growing produce. And fast forward pretty quickly, a few years into that, uh, I then met my mentor I ended up working with for years, Rich Pecoraro, one of the legends in, uh, in the seed, seed world the last you know, 40 years. And um, went to his farm one day and saw somebody cleaning, I didn't know what it was at the time, but saw him cleaning amaranth out in the distance. There's this beautiful black waterfall of seed with all this beautiful red chaff blowing off of it. They were threshing um, the, the chaff off. And ever since then, I've just been in complete service to it. It got me, the seeds wooed me, um, which is a cool, Part of this is that we often think of ourselves as the domesticators of seed, but you can really flip that and, and see how the plants of this world found this ape, this animal to take care of them because uh, we keep them alive and they keep us alive. You know, corn's not going extinct, carrots, wheat, lettuce, none of these crops. So that's how it ties back to you now, uh, the viewer, if you're watching this and you don't have any kind of relationship to seed, whether you realize it or not, you already do. Um, if you eat food, which I, I think most of us do, uh, that food came from seed, came from someone growing it, somebody saving it, somebody cleaning it, somebody putting it in some sort of a, you know package, getting it to a farm that grew it, that then got it to the store, and you eat it. So, so it really, if you want to get to the source of what we all kind of stand on to do whatever work it is that you do, whether you're, you know, an engineer, a teacher, a doctor, or, you know, working at the, at the cell phone shop, you know, you're, you're sustained by, by seeds still. And, and that's kind of the true, the true magic of this work is that it really connects us all. Um, no matter where you come from, you come from people that kept seeds and tended seeds. Um, all of our ancestors did it and and we're in times now, uh, I think it's a particularly um, important, both you know, spiritually and practically, for us to, to connect to this foundation uh, of our life again. And that's what we're focused on with Lineage Seeds. That's our seed company here, here in Puaca, New Mexico. 
big part of what we're focused on with the new seeds is uh, is twofold. Is one getting a seed bank in every home again. There's a lot of there's a lot of seed banks in the world that are keeping our genes alive, but we don't necessarily have access to those seeds. So we need regionally accessible seed banks that are working on getting uh, seeds grown in bulk, uh, diversity of seeds grown in bulk, um, and also supporting as many farmers as we can to you know get paid to produce these seeds again. So we not only grow, you know, about 80% of our seed, uh, we've been doing this about 18 years now, um, but we also are working on building a network of other growers. We get you seed if you want to grow it out, you grow it out, and then we pay you for that, you know, for that seed that you grow out. Show you how to clean it, uh, say you how to save it properly, how to store it. Um, and we also, we don't just offer our seeds in paper packets, we offer our seeds in ceramics. So for a lot of reasons, uh, ceramics are the tried and true method of storage from cultures around the world for thousands of years. So we don't glaze them so they breathe, they're porous, and they keep the mice and bugs out. They weaken any moisture that would build up and they, and they regulate temperature. So those are beyond just elevating the actual packaging of the seed uh, for your home. So you got some art in your home. Um, it's also going to keep the seed good for a lot longer than, uh, than a traditional you know, paper packet would, potentially. Um, and yeah, what, uh, what kind of seeds to have? Uh, why to have seeds if you're watching this and you're not a gardener? You know, we talk to a lot of people about the value of just being a keeper of seed. Just having these seeds in your home is, you, is a way of participating in keeping our genes alive. Even if you don't plant it, somebody might find that pot you have in your house in 50 years, 100 years, whatever, and those seeds in there might still be viable and they'll be really glad they found that pot. That variety might not be around then. Um, so we're really, you know, trying to bring, um, you know, people a, a very tangible relationship to this again, beyond just the practicality of planting it. And of course you want to plant it because that's where the whole magic happens. That's where the real relationship is, is in that whole season. Um, you know, from early spring to, you know, to late fall, all the things that happen for you outside in nature, the time, the long game of tending something, uh, there's certain lessons that you get from that experience in life that you really can't get any other way. Um, saving seed is not an experience that you can shortcut or, or fake in any way. Um, if you grew a crop out for seed and saved it yourself, uh, you participated in that, in that history. Um, and we also think that that history lives on in the seed. Um, they're a bit like, you know, you could, you could say they're like nature's microchips of data. They, they store not only what to look like, how to grow, um, but I think they also store, you know, the memory of all the people involved for thousands of years to keep these alive. Um, and so here in northern New Mexico, we particularly, because we live here and we farm here, we focus on the seeds that do well here. Um, so we grow a lot of our corns. We have about eight corns in rotation. Uh, we have a lot of chili in rotation. Uh, you see a bunch of reishers maybe hanging around. We've got some uh, rare variety from Ojo Sarco that I was given years ago. Uh, a lot of these are the traditional hatch. Uh, one of these is also a variety that we uh, are working on breeding with a uh, Moroccan chili for fun. A buddy of mine, uh, Matt, brought back a uh, chili from Morocco and we crossed it with a local chili here. And we're getting a whole new, you know, flavor profile, and uh, it's a really fun chili. So we're, that's another thing too, for that people don't realize is that it's not just about keeping all the old genes alive. Of course, that's incredibly important. It's also about making new varieties. You know, we, we our ancestors were breeders. That's how they got the seeds that we have today is that they were breeders. They bred just like dog breed when you think of it. Uh, no genetic engineering, it's a whole different conversation. Um, but you too can participate in creating new varieties in your garden just by playing around, crossing things, breeding and selecting. And then all of a sudden, you know, five, ten years later, uh, you got your family tomato again, or your family lettuce, uh, or whatever it is that you're working on, or chili. Um, and that's how we originally got the diversity of hundreds of thousands of different kinds of chilies or wheat or whatever it is it's because we had families in every region of the world growing all this um, and then those families travel and they share and they spread 
this one in my hand is a good example actually this is the, the sonoran white wheat this is the first wheat brought to north america by the spanish um i believe a, a priest named francisco quino gets credit for for bringing this to north america to new mexico and arizona um in the late 1600s so so although do seeds you know you can find the origins in specific places around the world we're we're the you know, the animals, the pollinator, the thing the, that are, they're a part of spreading these everywhere and getting them to adapt to different climates. Um, so it's a very, very long story that we've all been a part of for thousands of years. And it's something that's beautiful because it's not just a story, it's intrinsically real. It's, it's tangible. It's, uh, it's, it's so humble, honestly, that you can kind of look over it real easily. It kind of can go over your head because it's that simple, but it's also one of the most royal things to exist. Um, and any time you're planting, even if you're just playing around your garden, you're, I mean, that's planting a seed is, is believing in the future. Planting a seed is, is believing in our next generations, is believing in sustaining ourselves, is, is practically participating in taking care of your neighbors, you know, around you and, and feeding each other. Um, you don't have to be a farmer, you don't have to be an advanced gardener or anything. It's a, it's a relationship that's really just between you and the seed in a lot of ways too. Um, I've had seed, you know, call me in a, in a sense that I never in my life had any idea what it was, you know, never saw it, never ate it, didn't grow up eating it. And, and somehow, you know, plants have a tendency to kind of, uh, uh, romance you in a way that gets you to take care of them for, you know, for years. Um, so no matter what, um, what it is that you do or where you're at in, uh, in your relationship with, with gardening or farming, uh, it's, it's a worthy venture to keep and to tend and to have seed. So we, we invite you to have a home seed bank again, have a cool piece of furniture, a cool box, you know, some of our pots or put your paper packets in something cool that brings, you know, these genes back into all of our homes again, because every one of these that goes, you know, out into the world with the seed in it, there's just an exponentially, exponentially better chance that that genetic is going to be alive for thousands of years. So every one of these that we put out into your homes, we're just increasing the chances these genes stay alive. Um, and that's a big part of our mission. So you don't have to be, you know, a gardener to have a relationship with seed. Uh, you come from people that did this and you can bring it back anytime that you want. Um, so we, we hand make all of our pottery. Now uh, we throw on the wheel and then we fire for three days. We don't glaze them so they stay porous, so they breathe. Um, I think I mentioned already maybe that every culture in the world used ceramics for seed storage for thousands of years. Um, for a lot of reasons. They can be good for decades in these things, potentially. A uh, good rule of thumb for how long seeds last. If it's a soft seed that you can't break with your nail, or if it's a soft seed that you can break with your nail, like flower seed, marigold, lettuce, something like that, not gonna last for that long. A couple years, five years, maybe 10 years. But if it's a hard seed that you can't break with your nail, like wheat, corn, one of those, um, then it could potentially be good for 100 years. The oldest seed ever germinated was 2,000 years old, found in a clay pot. Uh, we consistently, in archaeological digs around the world, and especially in North America, uh, we find corn, squash, wheat, uh, dates, oats, barley, uh, garbanzos, um, all of these hard seed that, that are lasted for, you know, a thousand years plus. So that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the you know, the archeology span of our future. Is there what's gonna be found someday? And, you know, you keeping that seed in your house might bring that variety back for, for future generations. So we're just uh, on my porch here. Um, and this freesia here, I really love because it's a uh, chili from Ojo Sarco that uh, family, family got me or gave me. And they had the chili in Ojo Sarco for, I think at least, uh, you know, 100 plus, 200 years or so. And it's a way, people see Reesters now just as a piece of art, but this is a very practical way of not only eating it, using it, storing it, but also of keeping the seed. So there's seed in each one of these that we're probably gonna grow out next year because you can see the Reesters starting to get old. I let it hang for, you know, as long as until it got too brown. So um, yeah, we're storing in a, a, an old gene here, just hanging on the porch. 
Uh, this sorghum here, which you can see more hanging, uh, this is an African sorghum from South Sudan. And for New Mexico, if we were ever trying to grow a whole lot of grain for us to live on here, obviously, of course, we have corn, we have our wheat, we have our amaranths, those are our three main, and our beans. But sorghum has a lot of potential for growing bulk food here. You can use it a lot like corn. It's kind of like the African corn, same family as Poaceae. Um, dries really easy. You can use it fresh. You can make it into breads, uh, make all kinds of dishes with it. That's another little example of crop hanging here. There's another red sorghum back there as well. Because uh, our focus is really, you know, we really love the staple crops of the world. Uh, you know, from the wheats and barleys um, and oats from up in Europe to the amaranths and the beans and the corns from Central South America, to your, your sorghums and your tefs in Africa, your garbanzos, your lentils in the Middle East, uh, millet, rice, you know, the North American rice from all the people up in Minnesota, um, to the Asian rice. So staple crops of the world um, are, are the crops that we're really focused on at Lineage Seeds. We also have about 500 genes in our seed bank, lettuces, kales, brassicas, all that stuff. Um, but a lot of the staple crops really grow really well here in northern New Mexico too. We're still in a process of adapting like a lot of the brassica family to actually even do seed here. The brassica family is all your kales and cabbages, collards. They haven't been here that long. So you can grow, you can actually, you can grow some good brassicas here, your arugulas and your kales and all that. But the seed cycle is a two year process for most of those. Not arugula, it's one year. Gardeners, I know. Um, so for two years, the brassicas haven't quite, they just haven't quite been here long enough and people haven't tried to save seed for them long enough for them to do really well with the timing the altitude the heat the pest pressure uh so we're we're a part of this long game still of adapting seeds to new climate and that's a huge part of our work here at lineage seeds is uh is adapting new seeds uh to this climate in northern new mexico the two i'm most excited about right now that we're working on are, are chia trying to get a, a, a more northern chia chia goes great in chihuahua um, but it really likes colder nights than we have. It likes more desert hot days, cooler nights, and a little longer season. So we've been working on that for years, and every year that we get a little bit of seed that finishes, that seed has a little more data stored of, of this climate and this zone here. Uh, we're also working on a sesame long term. Um, yeah, and, uh, and, the, and the thing next year I really want to get my hands on is a dryland rice that a lot of people are working on. Dry, rice mostly grows in patties and water, um, and so there's some people that have been working on uh, and are a dry land rice through organic breeding techniques for a while. And so rice is one I'm really excited about. Uh, we already got barley in our collection, wheat, oats, sorghum, teff, amaranths. Um, so yeah, so these are just some on my dirty porch here. I will show you this amaranth over here too, because that's one of our famous crops here. Yeah, this is Golden Giant. So this was massive. Maybe there's a picture I can send Vic and he can put, uh, you know, in the, in the video right now. So this Golden Giant amaranth, staple crop South America for thousands of years and up here in North America for sure so on here if I just thresh it just a little bit you'll see a bunch of the seeds here so a bit like quinoa um, a similar family it's also related to pigweed a wild weed people call it but that's gonna be black seed the wild stuff the grains are gonna be yellow and gold um, just they're a cultivar they've been selected for a bit more nutrition a bit bigger um, and more yield per plant. So the, the cultivars of amaranth um, are gonna yield a lot, lot more um, than, than the wild ones, and it's gonna be bigger seed. So cultivars are the ones that humans have been working with, selected from the wild ones thousands of years ago, but cultivars are our crops that we have worked with for years to stabilize those genes to do what we need to, to live on, on agriculture, um, to finish a certain time, to harvest a certain way, to be easy to thresh as well. Um, another example here is some sorghum just sitting over here. This is actually a uh, Hungarian red broom sorghum. So most of the seeds already fallen off in the bin here. Uh, but here's another sorghum example. And this sorghum has actually been uh, selected to have these long brushes here. And this is used for brooms. So you can take all these seeds off, right? And then weave all these together and you got a broom. So our crops, like we haven't only been selecting for, you know, for the food quality, we've been selecting for dyes. Uh, one of our crops over there that Luke just picked is our Hopi red dye. Been grown here by the Hopi peeps and a lot of other peeps for a long time for uh, using as a dye. 
a really beautiful deep burgundy color. Um, we also selected almost medicinal crops as well. You know, so we've been working with nature for a long time to, you know, to, to work in symbiosis with these plants. We benefit, you know, from them and they benefit from us because we take care of them. And that's the beauty of this relationship. It's, uh, it's twofold. We take care of each other. All right, so I'm going to use this uh, little carrot flower um, as an example of, of uh, the dry process for saving seeds. So most of your seeds are a dry process. There's either wet or dry. Wet will be all your fruits, your tomatoes, your zucchini, your melons, eggplant, all that. Dry process is going to be just about everything else. Your lettuces, your carrots, your beets, um, all your grains. So at some point with the crop, you're going to have it on a head of some kind. Like it's going to be out in your garden, right? And it's going to finish, you know, sometimes summer, sometimes fall. You got to go to cycle for each plant. And then you're going to cut that head and you're going to dry it more. And all seeds are on that head, all right? So then you go through a phase of threshing. And this is just a small little garden scale I'm showing you. We do this at scale. We do machines. We use all kinds of stuff. It's just a little example. So then you're going to thresh it off. You can thresh it off by dancing on it, by hitting it with a stick, um, all kinds of ways. And then after you thresh, this breaks off the seed from whatever it's on. If it's on a pod, if it's on a flower head, whatever it's on. So you're just breaking the seed off of whatever it's holding. So that's the threshing process. Then you're going to go through a winnowing process, which uses the wind. So now we're even cleaner, right? And so then you go scream. So once it's all, you know, and you go back and forth from screening to winnowing. Winnowing uses the wind. And that's the, the quickest and dirtiest way that I can tell you about the dry process for saving seed. It's very different between every crop and every species and size of seeds. There's a lot of little nuance with all of it. Quick and dirty for saving seeds from, from your dry crops. All right, cool. So we just showed you a little bit of the dry process with the carrot, very small example. There's another very small example of what a wet process looks like. Um, so our Sweet Dakota Rose Watermelon. Do not judge it by this wheelbarrow. These things get huge. I drew this in a, I grew this in a trial garden and they were tiny over in this little shady trial garden. But in spite of that, even if you get small um, showings of whatever you're growing, the genes are still in there to be what it was. So even though we grew this in a little trial spot by my house, didn't do that well, uh, the genes of these seeds can still be what it's supposed to be. Um, so imagine, so this is for wet processing. Imagine what would the fruit do if we weren't you know, interfering? What would the fruit do to continue its life and its seed? It would fall off the tree and it would rot and it would ferment, right? That fermentation does a couple things. For one, it, it kills any disease, you know, that are in there. Uh, and it also cleans off uh, this little gelatinous coating that can be on a lot of the wet process seed, especially in tomatoes. Um, and it also breaks the seed, the fermentation breaks the seed off from the meat that it's attached to, which makes it a lot easier to get the seed out, especially for the humans that are, that are trying to save the seed. So these have been sitting here rotten and, uh, I don't know, for a few months now in this wheelbarrow. So I'm going to cut one open. Uh, it's going to be pretty nice and mushy for us to get a little example. Oh yeah. I'm just going to raw dog it barehanded. So old watermelon, right? So now I'm going to take all this meat, put it in here with the seeds in this bucket. All right. A little bit of this in here, a little bit of that. Actually doesn't smell that bad. You know, this is actually pretty good. Um, and you can, when you're doing this at small scale, of course, eat the watermelon and save the seed. We're doing it at scale and we're trying to save all the seed. So it takes a little longer to finish the seed. So now we got that. I'm going to get in here. I'm going to break it up. Now I'm going to add some water. All right, so. Fill this up a bit. Now, the good seed is gonna sink, okay? Good seed is gonna sink to the bottom. Any seed floating, you don't want. It's light, it's got air in it, it's not finished. See, most of them are white. The white seeds aren't finished, all right? So now we're letting this sit for just a little bit. I'm just, I can feel the seed sinking to the bottom. And now we're going to pour it, uh, pour it out in another container. So you'll see the bottom has all the seed in it. So here we go. Take in this bucket. And if it floats, it's no good. Don't worry about it. See all those floaters? And watch, there'll be a reveal at the bottom. Look at that. 
Boom, and you pull it back, and there's our seed. So then this seed, you then take, and you pour it on a screen, water goes through, seed stands on top. That's your very quick and dirty example of wet processing of seed. All right, so we mentioned before that a big part of our mission with Lineage Seeds is getting as many local growers as we can to you know, help contribute to keeping our, our, our seeds alive. So we gave a neighbor of ours, Dan, uh, some of our Snorin White. Uh, this is one of the, the from what I understand, the, the first wheat to get to North America. Uh, Francisco Quino brought this here in the 1600s, Spanish priest. Um, and yeah, it's been exchanged by, you know, indigenous peeps around here and locals for, you know, about, I guess, 400 plus years now. Most likely, I'd guess, the first wheat tortillas, because tortillas are a Central American, you know, and Southern North American culture. So I guess the first wheat tortillas were probably made from the Sonoran White, but just a guess, no verification. Um, so what we're doing here, our local homie grew it out in his garden next door. Uh, went and showed him how to harvest it um, it's been drying and so now we're about to thresh it again this is another example like the carrots of dry of the dry process of harvesting seed so it's real dry you want it to be as dry like crispy dry because then it just breaks a lot easier if it's got any moisture on it at all it's just gonna be a lot more work to break so I'm gonna show you an example of my hand of what we're about to do with our feet so there it is broken off the seed is coming off of there and then after we dance on it it's all gonna look like that Okay, and then the next phase I'll show you is going to be winnowing, which, you know, is basically going to get it to look like that. So now we've uh, pretty much got it all fresh, pretty good. Seeds in there with all the chaff and sticks. So now how do you separate all this? Well, you use the wind. Because the wind will separate by weight. And because we're in the future and we have electricity now, we can actually turn on the wind in the exact direction that we want. Do it with just the wind sometimes. Put a big tarp down, use a basket, it's fun. Um, but today we're gonna Use the old power of electricity. You can go three, probably. Yeah. Soon. So now you'll see. So in the first blow, a whole lot comes off. All the light stuff flies farther, and the seeds are heavier, so they fall down. And so we always catch uh, the first blow to make sure we're not blowing off seed just to be safe. So that's what I'll show you guys here. Sometimes it's still heavy and stuck on the chaff and the wind can take it. So this is the first quick and dirty to see where, where we're at. Well, All right, so I'll show you now what he's getting out of there. So now I'm gonna do a little rub. See how much seed we're blowing. Uh, do you see any? I don't see any. Yep, I see no seed in there. So we're good. Nothing's getting caught and blowing. So now we'll show you. Do one more, yeah, do more pour on that real quick. Yep. And then you guys will see the seed to drill itself real quickly. And uh, if you haven't seen this fancy equipment before, this is called a box fan. It was in my closet. And uh, these bins as well are. Uh, very fancy rectangular new material called plastic. All right, so now we 
pretty much blown. We'll do, we'll blow a few more times, but just for the video, we probably blow this a few more times, but I'll show you what it's like. So when you have things that are just as heavy as the seed, what are you gonna use to separate? If they weigh the same, the wind is gonna drop them. So then you use screens. Screens is size separation. So let me see if I can find one real here. That'll work. This one will work just for the purposes of this. So now, and we have many size screens. Uh, this is just a quick one I grabbed real quick. So there we go. So now we're screening off a bunch of the big stuff. See, it's just mostly stem. There might be a few pods left in here that we didn't quite get in our threshing, see like that. So anything heavy, we're gonna put back in, thresh real quick again, and get these last little maybe 100 seeds. Like there's a pod that we just missed dancing because we're doing it quick for the video. Um, there's some seeds in there, uh, but that's it. And so then you can see just a few more winnowings and screenings, and we're gonna be down to just the pure Sonoran white. All right, so you just saw us go from uh, our Sonoran white wheat right here to being threshed, winnowed, screened, down in the bucket here. Then what happens to go into our seed bank, it gets bagged up. And put away in our seed bank with the lot number. And the final touch, so whenever, if you all get seeds from us, uh, we then, you pick out a pot on the website or in person, and we pick out one of our pots for you. This is one of my favorites, the Galaxy series, black and white, fired for free, three days. And so your seed goes in the pot. You get about one paper packet's worth or so. And then the final touch, my favorite part, is a little scroll. We burn the edges of every single one. It's our last little touch of prayer. And the scroll says, variety name, days to mature, where we last grew it, and the known lineage of all the people that grew it before you. You're next. So you're next. So then the scroll goes in the pot. Star, six seeds around it. And one last little bonus feature. Makes a nice shaker. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks for watching this uh, very quick and dirty intro to my farm story and what we do with Lineage Seeds. And if you would like to support our work in any way, you can find us actually this weekend at uh, the Los Colandrinas Harvest Festival and online lineageseeds.com. Uh, and you can contact us at lineageseeds at gmail.com. And we're in the process of actually building. We just, you know, I. I've been doing this 18 years, but I have never owned a farm or had my own land to do this on. And now we are, you know, supported for the first time. We have a farm and, and we're trying to build uh, a, a public seed bank, a uh, nursery and ceramic studio where people are going to learn uh, ceramics and seed production uh, in the same place. And also a gallery where you're going to be able to find uh, all of our work in person. Um, we have a nonprofit affiliate that we work with too, because uh, a lot of our work is, is nonprofit. Uh, that you can also actually support us in that way. Uh, so thanks again for watching this uh, quick and dirty intro to Lineage Seeds here in northern New Mexico and I hope to see you at the Harvest Fest at Los Cuadrinas. <laughs>